Hello there, guys. Here is your video on the impacts of urbanization. So like I usually do, before we get into the impacts, let's start talking about what urbanization is. So it's the mass movement of people that um, are originally living in more agricultural areas, countryside, rural areas, to cities, suburbs, and some of the surrounding areas. So this has increased dramatically over the past century. If we take a look at this graph, we can see the fraction of the world's population that lives in urban environments versus rural environments. So what we can see is up to about 1800, it was a very tiny fraction of the population that was living in a town or a city or something like that. Um, hopefully you remember what major world event was happening in the 1800s, and that is industrialization. So as the industrial revolution happened, more and more people started moving to cities, and this trend has just continued. Right now, about half of the people on the planet live in urban areas. Notice that this goes up to 2050. That's a projection. And eventually, we're going to have more people living in cities than live in rural areas. So this is about 50% of the population, but that 50% consumes about three quarters of the Earth's resources. So if we're talking about sustainability, well, we have some issues with urbanization. So an urban area is defined, at least by the U.S. Census Bureau, as an area that has more than 386 people living in a square kilometer. Um, let's compare that with the most densely populated city in the U.S. That's New York City, which has 11,300 people per square kilometer, which seems like a lot until you look at the most densely populated city in the world, which is Dhaka in Bangladesh, which has 44,500 people per square kilometer. So quite a few people packed into a small space. That means you have higher population density, which is going to have a much greater impact on the environment. So why do people move to cities? Well, as the Industrial Revolution happened and as you started having mechanization and having like farm machines, you were able to replace some of your workers with these machines. And those workers no longer had jobs. At the same time, the Industrial Revolution was happening and all these factories were being built that needed people to work there. So there was more economic opportunity in the cities. People would move to the cities so that they could work at the factories and have jobs. Um, once cities were more established, there were other benefits. For example, educational opportunities. Um, even if a college or university wasn't originally founded in a, a large city, um, eventually a city kind of builds up around it. So a good example of that is like Texas A&M and College Station. It's very much a college town, but it's still a town. Um, similarly, in Dallas, you have multiple universities and colleges. So lots of educational opportunities. Um, there's also better access to health care. If you're in the countryside, you may have one doctor who is responsible for treating a large area and hospitals might not be located very close by. However, if you're in a city, health care facilities, hospitals, etc. are there in a higher concentration. Then there's also the cultural experiences you can have in the city. Um, for example, you know, there's all the arts and things. You can go see the symphony, ballet, you can go to museums, um, you can go to clubs, you can go to all sorts of things. So now that we've talked about urbanization and why it happens, let's talk about how it impacts the environment. One of the biggest examples we're going to look at is how it affects the hydrologic cycle, aka the water cycle. So in an undisturbed natural environment, you have precipitation. Uh, about 40% of it will evaporate and go back into the air. About 50% of it will infiltrate into the ground between the 25 that's shallow and 25% that's deep. And about 10% of it will run off to the, the nearby stream. However, we tend to cover our cities with these impervious surfaces. They don't let water pass through. So you don't have water going underneath concrete, for example, or asphalt for roads. And so a lot more water is going to run off. Notice the amount of runoff when you have an urban environment increases from the 10% in a natural environment to a full 55%. That's more than half of the water that is raining over a city just running off to the nearest river or stream. The problem with that is that you have much lower amounts of infiltration, 
and so you don't have water replenishing groundwater supplies. Um, this can cause a multitude of problems, like for example, that decreased infiltration, increased runoff, um, but it can also cause flooding, which we'll talk about in a moment. And another thing, notice that it has a lower evaporation rate, uh, which can affect precipitation patterns because when water evaporates into the air, it condenses and forms clouds, which can keep water in the local area because it'll precipitate back out. So let's talk about some of these specific consequences. With increased runoff, um, since you don't have a lot of infiltration, if you didn't have any system to, to try and um, mitigate the effects of this, you would just have flooding every time it rained heavily. So most cities have storm drains or storm water sewers, and these are systems that you'll see them in this the side of the street, kind of like that, that little cubby hole that Pennywise likes to hide in in the movie It, um, that you really don't want to lose a toy down because you will never get it again. Um, so these are storm drains, and when it rains, they will channel water into some sort of uh, system that will eventually discharge the water into local waterways. So it's not that it's not going to end up in the river, it's just it's not going to end up going down into the ground, which becomes a big problem. Um, and so what ends up happening is that sometimes these storm sewer systems are kind of overwhelmed by the amount of water, and that's when you can get a flash flood like what's pictured here. Um, that's something we have very common. We'll have flood, flash flood warnings or flash flood watches where you'll have to be careful if you're driving through low-lying areas because there can be collection of water that could stall out your car, like what this car is hap having happened to it. Uh, another consequence is all of this water, as it runs off across the surface, is rushing to the nearest stream or river. So let's say we had precipitation happen right here at the beginning time of this graph. Well, if you look at the flow rate in the local river before and after you had development in the area, you'll see a much um, different pattern of the change in flow rate. So, for example, before development, what you would have is after a rainstorm, you'd have a gradual increase in the flow of the river. Um, it would reach a peak and then it would decrease back towards the, the general level of flow. However, when you have all of this urban development and all of these impervious surfaces and increased runoff, what will happen is after a rain event, you'll have a large input of water into the river, increasing the flow rate dramatically. And then that will eventually go back down to the, the base level. But you're going to have this swell of water, which becomes a problem when you have like heavy rainstorms, for example, in the Mississippi River Basin. Then you'll have this large swell of water that can overflow the banks of the Mississippi, just kind of travel down until it reaches the mouth of the river. Um, so this causes a problem as well, because you don't want to have flooding of areas that are close to a river. The big thing is that you don't have aquifer recharge. So you have an area that's covered with all sorts of concrete and other impervious surfaces. surfaces. You don't have as much infiltration. And so you don't have water reaching the, the water table. And then you don't have recharge. So that decreases the flow of groundwater, which can have impacts. Because the groundwater system and the surface water system in an area do interact. Sometimes uh, groundwater will flow into surface water. Uh, sometimes it'll flow into the ocean, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but then just low aquifer recharge becomes a problem when you use aquifers as a source of water. Because if they're not getting replenished by rain and infiltration, they're going to empty up and empty out. And then you're not going to have water to drink. Another consequence of aquifer depletion that can happen because of this lowered recharge is what's called saltwater intrusion. So let's say that this is the level of shore. So this is land, um, and this is rock, and this is a coastline. So here we have the ocean with salty water. We have a water table underneath the surface of the, the land um, that is flowing through the rocks. Now, groundwater, just like surface water, is always flowing towards the ocean. So as it flows closer to this area with salty water, you start getting saltier water. So this would be like brackish water, a little salty, but not quite as salty as ocean water. And that would be this kind of um, gradual change that you would see. 
If you're pumping water from up here, it's okay because you're getting fresh water. If you were trying to pump from here, you'd be getting salt water, which you can't drink and you can't use for your plumbing. Salt water can be corrosive and eat away at your plumbing. Now, if we are pumping water from uh, groundwater and we're not recharging, that decreases the flow of water going from groundwater to the ocean. When that happens, the pressure of salt water can increase and it can start to flow into areas that used to have fresh water. So now you have this intrusion of salt water and brackish water into areas that you're trying to pump water from. And that becomes a problem because the water becomes saltier and it becomes unusable. So that's also an issue with urbanization. Um, another thing um, that cities can have a massive impact on climate change for two reasons. One, we burn fossil fuels uh, to power our cars, to power a lot of our electricity and homes and businesses, and that produces greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. Worse than that is we also have a lot of landfills. We have a lot of people who are gathered together. They produce a lot of trash. So our general um, general procedure is you take your trash, doesn't get sorted, just gets kind of dumped into a landfill. It's a mix of things like you can have organic waste, food waste, etc., and that stuff will decay. When it decays and is covered by a bunch of other stuff, there is no oxygen here, which is anaerobic conditions. So when you have an area with no oxygen, but you still have bacteria decomposing, they can perform cell respiration and they can decompose, but instead of producing CO2, they produce CH4, aka methane, same stuff that's in natural gas. But the problem is that natural gas or methane is a much stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So then that methane, it goes into the atmosphere and it adds to the greenhouse effect, which adds to climate change. There are some places which are starting to do uh, capture of this methane and use it, burn it for fuel. That still puts carbon dioxide into the air, but at least it's in the form that's kind of less, uh, less, uh, I guess I want to say dramatic, which is the CO2. Another thing that is a consequence of having people like grouped up into these cities with so much concrete is called the urban heat island effect. So if you live in a city, what you may have noticed is that on any given day, the temperatures are warmer inside the city than they are in the surrounding areas like suburbs. So in this top image, what you're seeing is you're seeing a graph showing a temperature at, you know, at a hypothetical city. So here is downtown. Notice downtown has the highest temperature because remember downtowns are often called concrete jungles uh, you don't have a lot of green space you don't have parks etc it's mostly just concrete and that concrete and asphalt and all of that absorbs heat um, it absorbs heat and then it may release it back into the air at night re resulting in like higher nighttime temperatures but it also just absorbs heat and keeps it in the area. So the areas with all the concrete become the hottest. So notice, for example, that the urban residential areas have slightly lower temperatures. Also notice that if you have a, like a park or a green space, that vegetation can absorb some of the heat and then that causes a decrease in temperature. Then you have another suburban residential area with roads, etc., that leads to an increase in temperature because it absorbs heat. And then only when you get to the rural areas do you have lower temperatures. Um, another factor is that everything, vehicles, factories, uh, HVAC units, so heating and cooling systems, all release heat into the air. And when you have a lot of people and a lot of buildings packed together, that can be enough to impact the temperature. Um, so if you look at this image, this is an image of the urban heat island effect in Dallas. So this is downtown. Here, for example, is Love Field Airport. Here is 635. Down here is I-20. And what you can see is around downtown and this area, you see much higher temperatures. Higher by a couple of degrees than some of the surrounding areas. Surprisingly, Oak Cliff is apparently cooler in this map. But 
This is the urban heat island effect. So this is lower temperature. But here, closer to downtown, maybe areas that are a, a bit more built up, those are going to be areas that are going to have higher temperatures. What are some of the consequences? Well, when there's high demand on the electrical grid in order to prevent like random blackouts, sometimes power companies will institute what they call rolling blackouts. What a rolling blackout is, is they'll purposefully shut down power to part of a city for a couple of hours. Um, and then they'll restore power to that part and they'll shut down power to another part of the city. What this does is since you're not providing power to you know, a certain number of homes and businesses, it reduces the pull on the electrical grid, which me means there's a lower chance of it breaking down. However, when you're in one of those areas undergoing this temporary blackout, you're not getting air conditioning, you're not getting electricity, which can cause problems. Um, when there are higher temperatures, there are health effects on people. You can get heat stroke. Um, even if the, the temperatures are severe enough and you don't have air conditioning or climate control, then you can even have mortality or heat deaths. Um, and that is going to be increased when you have higher temperatures, like in the urban heat island areas. There's also light pollution. Um, so this diagram is showing the difference between what you'll see in the night sky versus an inner, in an inner city versus uh, an area that is a dark sky site. Um, these are areas that are rated around the world as having very little light pollution. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I spend most of my time in the city, very little of my time in the, the countryside at night. I have only seen the Milky Way in the sky once when I was in the country. Um, and you may think, oh, well, okay, I don't see all the stars. Big deal. However, the fact that there is this extra light and it never reaches like full blackness can mess with the circadian rhythm or the natural sleep-wake cycle of both humans and animals. There are some animals who have behaviors that are light sensitive. So for example, big example, sea turtles. Sea turtles, when they hatch on a beach, are attracted to light sources, kind of like the moon reflecting on water. That helps direct them to the ocean, and it's an instinctive behavior. However, if you have a city nearby with bright lights, that can confuse them, and they'll go towards that light source instead of going towards the water. And if this happens, they can get injured, they can die if they don't make it to the water. So light pollution does have consequences. So let's talk about urban sprawl, which is a growing tent trend. Uh, it's basically you have an expansion of cities overtaking the surrounding countryside. So instead of just having suburbs, you have suburbs outside of cities. And then even further than that, you have what are called exurbs. Um, and so you have a larger geographic area that's just covered with city now. Um, so I have this map because it's showing, for example, this is Tarrant County, this is Dallas County. Those are labeled in this map as urban areas. And then these surrounding counties are labeled as exurbs, which are like suburbs of suburbs. Uh, another thing, this is the megalopolis, which is the large corridor of mostly uh, urbanized area that spreads from Washington, D.C. all the way up to Boston. Um, and some people are kind of you know, treating it like one giant city. Granted, it has individual cities, but this is a, an image at nighttime where you can see all the lights connected to see all the cities that are just kind of melting into each other. So what are the impacts of urban sprawl? Well, urban suburban areas are characterized by a few things. They will have low density residential housing, uh, something like what you see here single family homes more spread out. Um, then they'll also tend to use single use zoning. So they'll have a commercial area, a residential area, and an industrial area. These areas are separate and distinct from each other, and they can be separated by either open space, infrastructure like highways, or some sort of barrier, which makes it very difficult to walk from work to, to home or to the local shops. Uh, a lot of cities, especially in Texas, are designed like this. It's very difficult to get around without a car. So urban sprawl really increases our reliance on cars, which we'll talk about the impact of that 
in a moment. Um, instead, some people are saying what we should go to is a mixed use uh, zoning system, where, for example, here you have homes. Some of those homes could be multifamily homes like apartment complexes, uh, townhomes, duplexes, etc. And then you might have a commercial area where people could perhaps walk or bike to work. Um, and you wouldn't have people having to have a car in order to meet their basic needs. So what are some of the environmental impacts? Well, uh, this is actually a picture of an aerial um, satellite photo of San Antonio in 1991. This is the city area with some of its suburbs. By 2010, that area had expanded dramatically. So all this green area that could be like forest or, you know, some of it might be fields and cropland, all of that is now covered by concrete and covered by houses. So any organisms that live there have lost their habitat, which can cause a decrease in biodiversity. Another thing is if there's any fertile land around here, so you might have farms kind of spring up around a city if there's fertile land because they can provide food to the people in the city. But when you replace that with city or urban areas, you're going to lose some fertile uh, agricultural land. But the really big impact is in greenhouse gas emissions. So that increased use of automobiles is going to dramatically increase the greenhouse gas emissions of an area. So, for example, this diagram is showing by the size of a circle the total greenhouse gas emissions for uh, individual cities or urban areas. So, for example, Japan, this is probably the Tokyo region, is going to have a very high uh, greenhouse gas emission release. Um, this may be Moscow. Uh, here we see a lot of large cities in China. Um, here we see Mumbai and India. All of those areas with uh, high urbanization, large metropolitan areas are going to be releasing large amounts of greenhouse gases. And urban areas are responsible for about half of the sulfur dioxide a quarter of the nitrogen dioxide and a third of the carbon dioxide that are released into the air. And we're going to talk about those more with our unit on air pollution. So how can we improve the sustainability of urban areas? We can do a few things. Um, we can uh, prioritize energy conservation and incentivize it by either giving tax breaks or offering rebates. For example, if you buy Energy Star appliances, you can get a tax break on that. Um, using efficient building techniques and materials uh, so that what we're what we're building with could be made out of recycled materials or built in a way that minimizes waste. Um, could also be more energy efficient so you don't have to spend as much energy heating or cooling the area. Um, you can also uh, improve by water conservation and xeriscaping. That's using native plants that are adapted to local conditions, so you don't have to add a lot of extra fertilizer and irrigate. Um, also, reducing reliance on automobiles is a big factor. For example, making sure that near mass transportation hubs, you have houses, job sites, so that people can very easily use mass transit and avoid having to, to use cars. Um, you can also create pedestrian-friendly areas that are uh, going to have areas designated where people can walk easily, where there are things within walking distance, and then another thing is increasing the amount of green space. That's parks, trees, and things like that. So until we do that, that is a lot of us in cities sitting in traffic in our cars.